Hello, guys. Welcome to another episode of Conversations We Need to Have. Listen, tonight we are going to be tackling a very, very heavy subject um, within the church community and within the um, Black community, African American community. We're going to be discussing unpacking the complex relationship of homosexuality in the church. I have some very distinguished pastors and voices that can speak to this issue from both sides. Um, we have Pastor Marshawn Simon. Pastor Marshawn is the recent and newly appointed senior pastor of the House of Mercy Everlasting Church in College Park, Georgia. A native of Atlanta, Pastor Simon is also a writer and co-host of the Four Nine Podcast. We have Bishop Keith McQueen, Bishop Keith McQueen is the founder of Powerhouse Church Global, based out of Indianapolis, Indiana, and is located in five other cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, Boston, Greensboro, and Jacksonville. We have Pastor Marissa Penderman. Pastor Mar Marissa Penderman is an ordained reverend in the Unity Fellowship Church Movement and currently serves as a senior pastor of Unity Fellowship of Christ Church. We also have Pastor Adrian Sledge. Pastor Adrian Sledge is the pastor of Move Church out of Culpeper, Virginia. He's been pastoring for 22 years and served in various capacities at various churches around the country. How's everybody doing tonight? Awesome. Great, thank you. I know I didn't do you guys um, bios justice, so I'm, I want to take a moment to just have you guys just for, um, have you have you to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Maybe some things that I missed in the bio, so that our audience can um, sort of familiarize themselves with. We'll start with Pastor Simon. I knew you was gonna go first with me. That's never any fun. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mashawn D. Simon. Yes, as he said, the newly appointed um, senior pastor of House of Mercy Everlasting in College Park, Georgia. Um, and it's good to be here with you all. I know Marissa and I have known each other for a while, actually. She, she sort of raised me up in ministry. Um, and Bishop McQueen and I have frequented a few spaces before. Um, but House of Mercy was founded by our, our founder, Pierre D. Cox, who passed about 30 days ago. Um, and the members and the leaders um, felt it um, appropriate um, to to name me and honor um, one of his final wishes um, as his successor. Um, we recognize we 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 call ourselves um, a loving church that is a welcoming space for all individuals, regardless of race, creed, social economic background, what have you. Um, I grew up in the metro Atlanta area. Um, I started out as a journalist. Um, felt this little nagging of ministry on me when I worshiped with Marissa at Unity Fellowship um, and then decided that the best bet before I would do anything ministerial was to get my education. And so I got my Master's of Divinity from the Candler School of Theology at Emory University, where Marissa also went, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and have been serving at House of Mercy for the past seven years. I think okay. that's And we have Bishop Keith McQueen. You can just um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Okay. Uh, blessings to everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Zach, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, uh, greetings to all of you uh, that I am uh, having this conversation with. I'm certainly uh, grateful for 
uh, this opportunity to be a part of this. Um, I am the Bishop of Powerhouse Global Network. We are one church in six cities. We have our headquarters in Indianapolis, but we also have locations in uh, Chicago, uh, Boston, Jacksonville, Los Angeles, Greensboro, and um, and Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we also cover uh, several network churches, um, uh, 501c3 organizations, uh, organizations that are uh, community engagement um, based organizations, entrepreneurs, uh, those that have been called um, or since the call of God to shift uh, the marketplace, the world to make an impact. Uh, we provide covering for them. Um, I uh, also am married. As a matter of fact, this Saturday, I'll be celebrating uh, five years of marriage to my husband. Um, and so certainly grateful for that. Um, uh, what else can I tell you about me? Um, I, there's just so much. Um, what I would just say is I'm a man that loves God. I'm a man that loves God's people. Um, I value um, and I think it very critical um, to uh, know why you were born and to live authentically in such a way that it brings people into that sphere of wholeness and healing. And so I'm just grateful to be a part of, of this conversation. Thank you for having me. You yes, start. Um, Pastor Sledge. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Adrian Sledge, the pastor of and founder of Got to Move, also known affectionately as the Move Church, Move. We're about um, Pastor Sledge, Pastor Sledge, you, you're going in and out for some reason. Your your um audio is going in and out. All right, what about now? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, maybe I'm not. Yeah, so uh, Pastor Sledge, Adrian Sledge, the founder of Got to Move, uh, also known as the Move Church. The Move stands for maximizing opportunities, gaining victory through excellence. Uh, the Got to Move uh, blueprint has been around for about four years. But the move church, the actual worship part of our church, is only about a year old. Uh, we've been doing some things. Uh, we've been doing some things. We've been doing some Pastor Sledge, we're having some, some major technical difficulties with your audio. All right, let me let me try something else, man. What's the next person? Okay, so um, Pastor Marissa, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just say that I am currently the senior pastor of Unity Fellowship Church Greater Atlanta um, in the Atlanta area. I am a part of the Unity Fellowship Church movement, which is um, a social justice movement that hails out of Los Angeles, California. We're about 35, maybe closer to 40 years old. Um, our movement was born in the midst of another pandemic, which was the AIDS pandemic um, in the early 80s. And um, we do our ministry in the context of eradicating oppressions of all kinds. Um, we have a particular outreach to folks who have been marginalized by mainstream churches, um, LGBT folks, folks that um, are living on the streets, um, uh, folks that are just not traditionally welcome. Um, so we try to provide an extraordinary welcome to everyone. And um, our founder is the Archbishop Carl Bean and um, he coined the phrase, God is love and love is for everyone. So um, that's who um, we are as a movement. Um, I have been a part of the, the church for somewhere around 18 or 19 years. Um, I found myself pastoring it about five years ago after serving as its assistant pastor for about seven or eight years. And um, I'm originally from Boston, so um, I get there often. My parents are still there. And so, um, 
I'm glad to be a part of the conversation tonight. Okay, and I'm so happy to have you all. We're waiting on Pastor Sledge, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is a very heavy conversation. I'm quite certain all of you have been a part of certain um, conversations where there have been probably some um, um, contention um, because of the doctrine, because of the philosophical belief, because of the sociological um, aspect of this uh, particular topic. So I, I want to start out with this very simple question. Why is there such a complexity as it relates to uh, more specifically the African-American church in the issue of homosexuality? And we'll, we'll start with Bishop McQueen. Okay. Um, well, that is um, a great question. It's a very loaded question. Um, I think um, when you get into talking about homosexuality at the core, it's really about human sexuality. I think human sexuality in the African American community is just a very complicated uh, conversation. Um, and I think a great deal of that has to deal with, first of all, we have to be very clear that although our history does not begin with uh, slave ships and slavery, uh, there is a complexity in the uh, African diaspora that we aren't very sure of our history. Of course, we can go get a DNA test that can tell us, you know, that we're from the Congo or we're from here, you know, or, or, or wherever, um, you know, but the truth is, is that um, we just really don't know. A lot of that can get lost in translation. They can trace your geographical uh, history, but um, we know through anthropology that there's just a constant evolving of, 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 of humanity. So I say that to say that we can only kind of gauge that based on the African-American experience of coming um, uh, over into America. And our experience since we've been in America around human sexuality has just not been very good. It just really hadn't. You know, um, for a great deal of time while our ancestors were here, our bodies didn't even belong to us, okay? And so we really didn't have control over what happened with our bodies. There was um, this idea that it was the slave master's right to hurt, hurt you, harm you, abuse you, um, uh, engage in uh, uh, acts of rape with uh, men and women, um, uh, male and female slaves that they had. And, um, and so there's this detaching that takes place in order to survive, I believe that um, we develop mentalities that, you know, survive the reconstruction of the Jim Crow era. What happens in this house stays in this house. And you don't really talk about what's going on. You don't really talk about human sexuality. So at the core, before we can even engage um, uh, uh, homosexuality, we have to realize that there is a very unrealistic approach um, to human sexuality that exists uh, within theological confines that are really not theological, they're sociological, okay? And, um, but just the truth is, is um, the, the root of a lot of that complexity is hinged upon post-traumatic slave syndrome. It's hinged upon um, uh, the Bible being used as a tool to control people. And the best way to control people is through very natural needs and desires and, and making you turn against um, your own self, your own identity in a method to control you. Um, there is the complexity of, of course, just the miseducation of many of our clergymen and women um, that, that cannot properly divide the word of truth. Um, but I think it's hinged upon a multiplicity of factors that has kind of created the conundrum of, of, of hatred and inappropriate theological misappropriation towards same gender loving people and, and transgender individuals as well. Okay. And, and, and Bishop, you said something that was very key because I think um, in the affirming and the non-affirming church, a lot of times what I hear is a confusion between what is theology, what is sociological. And so there's always a conflict because 
a lot of times what, what comes up with the pulpit um, out of both particular um, uh, perspective is a preaching of a sociological position versus a theological position. So I, I want to unpack that for a second. And I'll ask Pastor Penderman, how do you how do you deal with the the notion as a pastor um, who um, deal with multiple people? How do you deal with the notion of separating the sociological and the theological, or is that even possible within the African American church? Um, I, I I think that it I don't um, think that is possible actually. Um, because I think our theological perspective is always informed by our sociological perspective. Um, most of the things that we apply theology to are social constructs. Um, most of the things that um, we create dogma around are based on how we're socialized. Um, I grew up as a, a good Baptist girl um, my mother is still the mother of her Baptist church, um, and Baptist doctrine was um, instilled in me from a child, um, and, um, and some of that I continue to embrace, um, and much of that I've had to unpack for myself um, because um, it was given to me, um, and I didn't have a chance to explore it and own it for myself. And so when I did have that chance, I realized that much of my theological perspective, what much of what I believe about who and who God is and what God does was based on how I was raised and how I was socialized in a world um, that believed certain things. And, um, and so it's really, really difficult um, to separate the two. My approach as a pastor though, is to say to people that you have the right to be in a relationship with the God of your understanding, which means that you have to understand God from your lived experience. Um, and I encourage people to unpack the things um, that are painful um, um, because I believe that one of the greatest forms of violence that we as black folks experience, and God knows that we experience a lot of violence, um, is spiritual violence. Um, and recovering from spiritual violence is incredibly difficult, no matter how you identify. Right. And and so, I, I, because I want to sort of, um, and it, it, again, as I talk to you all behind the scenes, it's not my intent to, uh, well, I'm not going to say it's not my intent, <laughs> but it is my intent that if I do offend, I will offend everybody equally and have everybody <laughs> upset with me. Um, equally, because um, and I'm quite sure that I'm probably going to get in trouble for even having this particular conversation, and I'm okay with that. But I, I want to ask um, Pastor Sledge, what is your view on homosexuality as it relates to the church? Um, and do you feel like that is something that God will um, use? Um, can God use a pastor such as Bishop McQueen or Pastor Simon or Pastor Penderman if they are um, living an affirming lifestyle as homosexual men? Okay, can you hear me now? I'm good. Yes. Uh, this this is my thing. Uh, this is where I stand on him on homosexuality, but I also have a stance on the treatment of how we treat uh, individuals who. Or uh, in that, uh, I call it the alphabet community because they add letters, the LBGT. Yeah, so they add so many letters. I call it that. So don't, don't get offended if I call it the ABC community. Uh, here's my stance. Me personally, based on my understanding of scripture, uh, I do believe that homosexuality is sin. The sexual act, the sexual act, not uh, because you got to remember, not everyone that's homosexual or gay is actually having sex. So let's be clear about that. Uh, but, however, what's the greater sin is the treatment of these individuals or how we treat them from the pulpit. Uh, the name calling, the, 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 uh, the misuse of not understanding, uh, of not listening to understanding what they're going through and where they've been. I think, that, like uh, Pastor Penderman said, there's a lot of abuse that goes on 
uh, with these group because of a lack of understanding, a lack of understanding. Uh, I don't I don't put homosexuality uh, no different than adultery. Uh, it's no different to me than lying. Uh, it's no different to me than gossiping and, and creating dissension in the church. But I believe uh, that issue is that community has been attacked by the church in a very disrespectful way. Let me, let me be honest. Uh, one of the most offensive things that I heard ever from the pulpit, I believe it was a couple of years ago, it was at a conclave or some convention when the pastor made some comments about people, men bleeding like women and stuff um, that like was that. Bishop, Listen, and I, I want to interrupt you because I believe in calling names. That was Bishop okay. Errol Carter. Okay. Yeah. So, so that was very offensive to me because at the end of the day, my Bible preaches love. Now, as far as Bishop McQueen and, and Pastor Penderman, uh, I believe, and this is what I believe, and I may get in trouble or whatever, but I believe that God has certain people and pastors in position to pastor other people. Uh, the reality is a lot of us in the church, uh, we only accept those individuals if they're talented. If they can play a piano, if they can sing, if they can direct our choir, we have a hands-off approach. But Lord forbid, if you're gay and don't have any talent and can't sing, uh, then we're sending you to hell. So, so my stance is, is that I believe, you know, I, I, you know, I have my beliefs in what I scripture, but under no circumstances do I believe that that homosexuals, all of them, are going to hell. Uh, I don't believe that God doesn't love them because my Bible tells me that nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Also, we have to be careful um, with this belief that you can convert all of them. Because uh, if, 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 you be, if you educate yourself and, and you exercise wisdom, uh, you can talk to 100 people who, who are gay or homosexual or whatever they, what you want to call them, and they might give you 100 different reasons why they're gay. So you, it, it's, it's like you can't put them all in a box and attack all of them. Uh, for example, you have you may have a young man who's already struggling uh, with his sexuality, whether he doesn't know what he is. And we're in the pre and we may be in our pulpits preaching. These guys are going to hell, calling them punk sissies or whatever that foolish to call them. And then you find out years later that the reason this young man is struggling with his sexuality because your deacon who's been married to whoever for 30 years has been molesting him. So there's a lot of uh, the church has to be uh, mindful of these things. We have to start preaching love and redemption to Jesus Christ. We have to stop attacking individuals. You, and I'm a firm believer just because you don't, uh, if I don't condone something, it doesn't give me right to condemn. It doesn't give me the right to convict. Uh, the If I operate within the the, the uh, outline of the, the message in the in the ministry of Jesus Christ, then I'm, I'm reaching outside my um, area of expertise anyway. My job is to preach love, preach redemption through Jesus Christ, and I believe individuals got to handle that between them and God. And that's where I'm at. But I think I think the type that type of ministry, because here's the thing. Can I can I be honest? If they can't come to church with us, where the hell are they going to go? So the bottom line is, I think the, the these ministries out there, they're doing great ministries. Uh, you may not like it. You may not uh, hate it. You might think it's sin or whatever you want to call it. But the bottom line is, is that these people have an opportunity to, to worship, to praise God, and, 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 and based on who they are uh, and what they are. So so the thing is, is that I have no issues with that. I think if, if now here's the thing, if we got a problem with it, then maybe we need to tighten up how we handle and how we treat people as far as black churches. And, so and, that's Pastor, I, I, and I want to get Pastor Simon to respond to your position based on his perspective. Well, I um, my, I think my perspective comes from um, several of the different places, several of the different statements that have been made thus far in the conversation. Um, so I will start with, um, I, I always, when I was in seminary, it was always interesting to me the ways in which we would engage certain texts um, and say that these were the texts that spoke to certain issues. Um, and, and, and we as a body, all of us, whether we're affirming or not, um, have all been guilty of parsing a text so that it works and it fits the way in which we want it or do not want it to. Um, so one of the things that I learned very quickly is that we have to abide by everything in context. Um, for me, the same scriptures that individuals speak to as being um, 
um, the, the, the roadmap for how we deal with homosexuality or how we perceive homosexuality aren't always the appropriate text to be, to be trying to engage these topics on. Um, we, we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was about hospitality. Um, we talk about the issues that Paul speaks to in many of his texts. And those were about, um, in my pers from my perspective, about keeping, um, keeping the communities going and the ways in which we preserve our communities versus um, allowing our communities to be wiped out. Um, I have done a great work of um, no longer being bothered um, when someone says to me that they have an issue with who I am and how I am, because at the end of the day, um, the only thing that really matters is how the Lord feels about me. And if I am doing what it is that the Lord has designed and ordained of me, um, and if I am proving um, God to be true and authentic and, um, and sincere. Um, and so I can, in a lot of ways, respect okay. anyone. Um, can, I, can I push back on the statement? Go for it. Um, so when, when you say you're not concerned about um, how an individual feels, you're only concerned about what the Lord thinks. So what do you say to a person who feels like um, you are out of sync or you're not in tune with what the Lord is saying because you live a homosexual lifestyle? And I'm, I'm simply I'm asking questions that people wonder, but they're not going to ask. I understand that completely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's still like, for me, it really comes down to how are you, especially if you are someone who was called to preach, minister, and care for God's people, how are you treating them at the end of the day? And what is the messaging that you're putting out there for them? If you are saying that you are, 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 are a ministry that is about love, um, then I think we should be a little careful about the language we use um, because some of that language sort of you know, contradicts that love from my perspective. Um, but I, I stopped a long time ago worrying about how people felt about me. Um, and, um, because as, as a young man, and Marissa knows this, as a young man coming up through my teens, um, I struggled very hard with, um, what everyone kept saying about who I am and my, and my identity and that I couldn't minister. I, my own mother even said one time that the Lord doesn't hear my prayers. Um, and that was painful. But I had to do a very real work to say, this is where she is. And I understand that, you know, in a lot of ways, our mothers um, worry about some of us because they're worried about our soul salvation. And for years, preachers have told them that if their children were gay, their children were going to hell. And mama want to be in heaven with their baby. And so mama believes that um, at the same time. Um, so with that, I, I had to stop giving that weight. Um, I, I, what we try to do at House of Mercy Everlasting is for those individuals who have heard that language, we try to help them to build their own relationship with God and to do the healing work they need to do to be able to see God within them and the purpose that God may have for them. So if they are under a pastor who says that you having sex with someone of the same sex is a sin and God is displeased with that, then I, what I try to do with those same individuals is say, they shouldn't be worried about who you're having sex with anyway. Right. Are you still abiding by that which the Lord has ordained for you to do and be in this world and treat others that you come across with the same love and respect and grace that the Lord has um, required of you? And, and that leads me to another question um, from a from a psychological perspective. Um, and I've asked this question several times and, it, and it's um, sort of the answers are just strange. But, and, and I made a post about this, it's interesting that a non-affirming church um, will have a high population of um, people who embrace the homosexual lifestyle. So my, my question is, and I'll ask Pastor Penderman, and then we'll go to Bishop McQueen to um, sort of answer this. Why do you think it is that those who are living in a homosexual lifestyle torment themselves by going to a church that have publicly stated they could never accept them as being who they say they are as for the gay man or a gay woman, but yet they continue to go back to this church. They continue to um, be the recipients yeah. of the side eye. They continue to be the recipients of, you know, why does he have this on? Why, why does this, uh, whatever the case may be. Why do you think, um, especially in the African-American church, why do you think they are so um, enthralled 
with a particular section of the church when there are other options such as Pastor Simon, such as Bishop McQueen, such as uh, Pastor Penderman? Why do you think the homosexual community is so enthralled with going into a setting where they can not be accepted by the doctrine, just simply based on the doctrine and the standard of that church? Um, I think it's complicated. Um, the church for many of us is an extension of our family. Um, many of us grew up in a particular church and in, in, in a particular denomination. And it is just family. It is it is where we um, find our place. Um, sometimes there are really wonderful things that happen in those places that we attach ourselves to and allow ourselves to ignore the painful places because um, we, we're, we're taught that you, you don't just get rid of family. Um, so I think that that's part of it. I also think that um, self-hatred is a part of it, that um, even though I might be um, living in a same loving um, relationship or I might have desires toward same-sex individuals or whatever my situation is, it doesn't mean that I um, have done the work um, psychologically or emotionally to accept myself. Um, and so I, cont I, I, I go there and I listen to painful things because I believe them also. Um, I, I listen to people talk about me as an abomination because I believe I am an abomination. Um, and so um, we hear these messages about separating the sin from the sinner and people think of themselves as sinners. And um, that's been my journey. Um, I came out to my grandmother when I was 11 years old. I told her I liked girls the way I thought other girls liked boys. Um, and my grandmother was um, deeply religious and um, and said to me, you know, God loves you. God made, made you, knows everything about you and God loves you. And um, I could not hear that for another at least 10, 12 years in my own life. And she was trying to free me. And um, I had heard so many counter messages and I had embedded in me the belief that there was something wrong with me, mm -hmm. that it took me a long time and a lot of therapy to really um, come to a place where I love myself. And I think that um, we as um, a Christian community in particular, because that's that that's where I'm from is the Christian community, that we do a really good job of talking about um, Jesus's mandate to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love God with all our hearts, mind and soul. But we do no work around teaching us what it means to love ourselves. So how do I love my neighbor as myself when I haven't learned to love myself? And so um, that's some of the work that I try to do now, both for myself and others, because it was not on the radar of my spiritual leaders when I was growing up. Um, and so I, I, I think there are all kinds of reasons, and I think you could talk to several people and they would give you their own, but um, just in my experience, those are some of the, the major reasons why people stay places where they're being harmed. And let me say, Pastor Penderman, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I, and, and it was not my intent for you to be the only woman on the panel. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was talking to Pastor Simon about this um, because I believe in having balanced perspectives and balanced voices. Um, but it just didn't work out that way. But it's something about you that is just very calming. I don't know how to explain it, I don't know how to explain it um, but it's a, very, it's a very calm demeanor that you have. Um, in the midst of four men and you're commanding the stage. So I just wanted to point that out. I, it, I really appreciate you for taking the last minute um, invite to be a part of this very insightful conversation. So Thank I wanted to put, I wanted to put that plug in. But Bishop Keith um, McQueen, can you expound on what Pastor Penniman was saying about why um, those within the African-American community specifically why the homosexual community feel the need to constantly 
go into an environment where they cannot be accepted based on the standard and the doctrine of that environment? Um, I think uh, Pastor uh, Benjamin uh, did a pretty decent job with with uh, kind of covering those spaces. But I'll add to that, um, you know, it really, to be very honest with you, um, is culture. I mean, it's just it's a it's culture. Um, the the black church has played a very uh, pivotal role in the matriculation of African Americans within this country. And I think um, the biggest challenge is, as she said, it's just a certain level of loyalty. You know, my, my grandmother went to this church and my my aunt pies for this church and I went to vacation Bible school here and it's a sense of familiarity. And so um, when it's been drilled into your head that this is an abomination and this is wrong, and you hear there's an affirming church or you encounter a conversation, one conversation, unfortunately, typically won't undo right. 30, 40, 50 years of just theology. It just really won't. Um, and there's a certain role that we're not very honest about, okay? The truth is all churches, including affirming churches, are very theologically dishonest. Uh, we are ecclesiastically dishonest as it pertains to the authority that the pastor has, the preacher has, that microphone. It has a psychological effect over the minds of people. And so when you have someone who gets up with any kind right. of opinion and call it a word from the Lord, people come under the, the subjective nature of feeling like coming against this idea is coming against God. And you're asking me to choose between my eternal soul or salvation or human sexuality. You combine that with a media, with uh, statistics and um, a dynamic that kind of portrays um, LGBTQ plus people as being um, promiscuous. Um, by the way, I personally don't think, you know, I, I understand the concept of the letter of the alphabet. I think it, it is very important to respect people search for identity in a very complicated world. Um, but I think with the LGBTQ plus uh, community, there is a sense of, 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 of needing to find parallels of positivity when all that's been presented to you from family and even media with the exception of maybe the last five years, five, 10 years has been, oh, you all are promiscuous and it's all about who you have sex with. And this is what all of that is about. And this is, can, I, I want to stop right there because you bring up a very good point. Um, and I was watching again, this is not to implicate anybody on this particular platform, <laughs> but um, I like to be very direct about my position. So I, I, um, when we talk about John Gray, um, and now that is promiscuous behavior, right? But because of the, the, because, and this question that I'm setting up this question for Pastor Sledge. Because of the, um, it, it's almost common in the black church for a pastor to cheat on his wife. It, I mean, it's just, it, it's almost just the thing to do. So my, my question is for Pastor Sledge, how do you uh, reconcile the behavior of someone, and this is not to, uh, I'm only using Pastor Gray as an example um, for this particular context, but for someone who who has um, been caught up multiple times in um, infraction, marital infractions, how do you deal with the notion of that versus someone? Um, you you have a straight man who can't be faithful to his wife, but you have a gay man who is faithful to his husband. Um, Pastor says, does that make a difference in the level, or does that change your perspective about the? Um, homosexual community just simply based on those particular um, core values? I, I think there's a, uh, there is a double standard. I think there's a double standard. Uh, but like I said earlier, I believe that uh, I believe sin is sin, but however different sins affect people differently. Uh, let, let me explain to, the difference is if you have two young men who are married and faithful to each other, yeah, your argument can be they're living in sin, but that relationship doesn't affect nobody else negatively. 
You see what I'm saying? That relationship doesn't affect anybody negatively. Uh, what John Gray does, uh, that sin affected not only himself, but it affected his wife, it affected his children, it affected his family uh, and embarrassed his family. So we do have to start kind of looking at there's a different level of accountability. If I, if me personally had to make somebody accountable first and I had to make a choice, I'm all over the John Gray situation because his sin affected more than more more than one person and affected other people and destroyed other people's lives. Not only not only did it embarrass his wife, uh, but also from a uh, let's be honest, and I'm not making excuses for anybody, but the reality is, is that anytime pastors like us are in a, in a position of leadership and we and we take advantage of people or persuade people, to me, that's not, that's, that's almost a form of race. That's no different what David did with Bathsheba and, and uh, using your authority to gain. So I believe there are some distinct differences. Uh, also, um, um, just, you know, that whole situation, I'm, I'm very careful i'm very careful about challenging people publicly about their private lives regardless even if it's been put out in the public now let's look at leadership now as a pastor now here's the thing and i'm here to raise my hand not all pastors cheat uh, not all pastors cheat uh you know my thing is that i take my anointing i take my anointing very seriously uh I take my marriage very now. Have I cheated in the past before I became a pastor? Before I became a preacher? Yeah, I did a whole lot of stuff. So I, me, on the one hand, I'm not in no position to really judge anybody of their lifestyle. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, but I think there's a double standard. Also, it it's, it has a lot to do with, like I said earlier, talents and gifts. Because here, John Gray is a talented preacher. Listen. All he got to do is preach the right sermon, preach the right sermon. Guess what? We're we're back. He's back in our good graces. Uh, so you have a lot of pastors who are very charismatic, uh, very talented that can preach themselves out of a proper paper bag. But you have other people who are struggling with their, uh, you know, uh, just trying to be accepted for who they are. And we are so quick to judge and point fingers that because to me, uh, who am I to make somebody have to reconcile with God? That's between them and God. At the end of the day, uh, even if we don't agree with it, even if what we feel is sin, we there's still that's still between them and God. And and and, and, and I, I want to um, first of all let me say this: I've never heard John Gray preach anything that I would waste my time listening to. Um, but that's the, that's the very first thing. But secondly, I want to address um, your your. Um, your idea of sin, and I want to sort of do a juxtaposition of your view of sin versus what Pastor Simon would consider sin. So can you give me, Pastor Simon, a working definition of the theological um, definition of sin? And Pastor um, Sledge, can you give me a working definition of the um, your theological perspective of sin? Pastor Penderman, you tripping so me out. So I have out. to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know what I'm about to say. I, I, so I have to be very honest that I struggle. So, so sin is a trigger word for me. Um, sin is very much um, a, a trigger phrase because of the ways in which it has been misused and utilized um, to oppress all of us um, in one way or another. Um, verse, it, it, regardless of your sexual orientation or the fact that you may well white after Labor Day, like the way in which sin has been used um, in the past is um, triggering for me. My working definition of sin um, with that in mind is um, um, any proclivity um, that a person may exercise that the greater society and the greater theological society believe should be used to oppress them. Um, uh, and we've seen it utilized throughout the historical biblical text. Um, sin was the, the, the way in which we control people so that um, we could get certain messages across for them to act a certain way or be a certain way in the biblical text. And we see it re to come alive today. Um, so I always, and, and I know I'm going to get in trouble with a lot of people for this. I always push back against sin because one, I despise the word because of the ways in which it has been utilized to control and oppress people. Okay. Uh, I respect that totally. I respect, and I get it. And I totally get it. Uh, 
let me let me be let me say this first before I kind of give my definition. One, I am not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. Uh, I I believe sin. I believe sin is the willful miss of uh, the willful disobedience of the God's word mm-hmm. on on uh, uh, and his statutes and his commandments. However, uh, my theological point of view is always dealing with the seed and the root of of people's actions. Uh, you cannot really deal with sin without dealing with the root, whether, whether you're a preacher, you talk about sin or not. And I think where people have failed, they have failed to deal with the root of why people have certain actions. And, and we're so quick to pull the sin card because many of us as preachers don't, cannot, and I'm just using us in general, do not know how to articulate the word of God. Because when you really look at it, let's be honest, Jesus did not really deal with sin a lot. Uh, when he talked about it, when he, like, even with the woman that was caught into adultery, all he said was go and sin no more. But it wasn't no theological debate. It wasn't no chastisement. Uh, and we have to be real careful how we deal with sin because many of us are dealing with it irresponsibly from the pulpit. And, and, and I think we'll come off better. And I think many pastors are being criticized, the ones that preach grace mercy god's will they're being criticized that you're afraid to to talk about those areas but i don't don't think uh i don't think they're necessary they're really necessary to be honest with you i don't believe you have to preach about uh adultery you don't you should you talk you don't have to really preach and send home homosexuality i think if you preach love grace and and the uh and who jesus is i believe within their own self the holy spirit will convict individuals i think we spend too much time uh, trying to convict people ourselves with our uh, with our own voice, then using and allowing the Holy Spirit to do His will, and 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 uh, we we're overstepping our boundaries in so many areas. So I get it why people don't want to hear about sin or people cringe because we have used sin as a way to keep people bound. Matter of fact, uh, slaves people uh, slaves were considered sinners if they didn't obey their masters. Uh, uh, Native Americans and were considered sinners if they didn't comply to the colonizers' way of thinking, a way of Christianity. So what I'm saying, so I get it. We we have really abused uh, sin, uh, but even in the midst, if you believe that sin is the uh, outright disobedience of God's word, at the end of the day, that's a relationship between them and God, and we have to be very careful how we cross that line. And. I, I want to ask this particular question um, to Reverend S- Pastor Simon, pa- Bishop McQueen, and Pastor Penderman. How do you respond to people who say that you all are, um, when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, that you all negate certain scriptures? Um, I know Pastor Simon touched on this earlier, but that would say that you negate certain scriptures that would um, place homosexuality as a sin or as an abomination in the sight of God. How do you respond to people who um, who have that position um, as it relates to that particular lifestyle? And we'll st- I wanna hear from Pastor Penniman first, and then we'll go with Bishop McQueen and we'll um, ask Pastor Simon. Let me, let me make sure I understand your question. How do, I, how do we respond to Yes, ma'am, I'll ask again. How do you respond to people um, who are not gay affirming, um, who say that the, those who are acceptant, accepting um, of the homosexual lifestyle, um, those who are um, pastors of gay affirming churches, such as Pastor Simon and Bishop McQueen, um, what do you say to people who would say to them, you are overlooking or ignoring the truth of scripture as it relates to this lifestyle? Because there are some people who say the Bible says it's a sin, it's a sin. And they will go on to quote, you know, the Leviticus scriptures and other scriptures about um, men will become lovers of themselves and things of that nature. How do you respond to those who have that position? Um, I would or say that, that I, I would say that um the Bible um, is a book that has been interpreted many, many, many times um, throughout generations. Um, and, um, and the interpretation of scripture is a really important part of 
of um, engaging uh, your your religious perspective because we are we are of 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 a book religion. Christianity is a book religion, um, and we learn what we learn from the book. But the book is open to interpretation, um, and I think that um, God is still speaking. That's one of the tenets of the Unity Fellowship Church movement that that revelation and um, did not stop with the Bible writers because God is yet alive and God is still speaking. And um, there were writers of, of Genesis, for example, that were writing from the perspective that the world is flat. And um, we, we now know that the world is not flat, but that was the worldview at the time. Um, and so we continue to grow and change and um, develop. Um, there were, as Pastor Sledge said earlier, um, it was at some point popular to preach um, slave obey your masters. Um, you would probably never hear that preached in any um, predominantly African American church right. in the country. Um, there are a lot of texts in the Bible um, that have been misinterpreted. Um, and that um, have been um, interpreted in ways where we isolate the text and and um, pull one thing out of it and we don't read it from the beginning to the end. Um, there's a lot of um, ways that we use the Bible, but, um, but for me, um, what I remember as I study the Bible, I, I revere it. I, uh, it is authoritative to me. I, I have not thrown it out. I, I actually consider myself a biblical scholar. Um, I preach from it every Sunday. And um, so I have great respect for it. But what I've come to know is that it is not God. Um, it is not, I don't believe it is the word of God exclusively. Um, I believe that God speaks in so many ways through so many vehicles. And so to hold it up as the only word of God, I believe that it is inspired. Um, I believe that it is, it, it, it is um, that the people that were writing it had great inspiration. Um, but I believe that there are many authors with great inspiration. And I believe that once I read the text, it is then my responsibility to sit and hear from spirit directly. Um, and and um, that is my process and that's what I do. And so I think that um, just like we have um, umpteen denominations because people who agree on some things just don't agree on others and they end up splitting and um, we have black denominational, denominationalism in this country um, because we didn't agree about something. Um, that that is that there's no difference between that and those of us who interpret a text um, in a way that is more congruent with our lived experience than um, and and move in that way and. Um, yeah, so that's what I believe. I believe that people are interpreting things the way that spirit give, gives utterance, and I think that that is appropriate. Okay. Um, Bishop McQueen? Um, uh, to answer your question, I, um, you know, when I was completing my um, first degree in clinical psychology, I spent a great deal of time unpacking a lot of information about what I grew up being taught, and I think one of the first conclusions I arrived to was the Bible is not a person. So when people say the Bible says, who is that? What does that mean? If you resurrected an author from the and resurrected an author from the New Testament, they probably wouldn't agree with each other on some of the same facets, yet they are both contributors to the canon of scripture that we have. And I think the biggest challenge is when people say the Bible says, 
well, the Bible is not saying anything. Well, the Bible, according to the Bible, well, according to the way that you interpret what you're reading. Um, and so I think we have to be very clear. I don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. I think that um, personally, I believe that Jesus Christ is the word of God. Um, the word was in the beginning, and I can tell you the Bible was constructed. So there's a problem there. Um, I think um, anyone that holds on to that stance and that belief system, first of all, um, honestly, Zach, I don't think anybody is a biblical literally. I don't think anybody interprets the Bible literally. I can go into the scripture right now and find scriptures that condemn shellfish, that condemn uh, the mixing of fat, all kinds of uh, texts that were applicable to address certain sociological or even economic issues. Time that really have nothing to do with anything that's applicable in the year of our Lord 2020. And so um, uh, to flat out answer your question, when someone comes to me, I say, you know, God bless you. If that are um, the Lord bless you and keep you. If I discern that that person is genuinely open to um, examining and reconfiguring where they stand, then I engage them in conversation. Um, but I think it's really important for us to be very clear um, that the Bible does not have, it, the Bible is not a democratic Bible. It's not a Republican Bible. The Bible does not have a political view. It does not have a view on uh, human sexuality, gender identity, all of the above. It is not a person. The Bible is a library that expresses the relationship between humanity and divinity over thousands of years. And to approach it with that concept, especially if you are African-American, um, as a person that the Bible has been used to denig denigrate, humiliate, and intimidate you, I think it is um, very um, theologically dishonest to engage a perspective and stream of thought that once imprisoned you as well. So that's my perspective. Okay. Um, Pastor Simon? Um, there really isn't much more to add to what has already been said. I, I accepted a long time ago that for me, um, the Bible is a journal. Um, it is a collection of stories based off of the ways in which people saw their relationship to God and the ways in which God engaged them in their lives. Um, it's very contextual and written for a certain group of people who had a certain perspective at a certain time. And so we can utilize it as a guide to show the ways in which God has shown up for these people and the ways in which God can also show up for us. Um, but to, to add to what Bishop McQueen said and Pastor Penderman said, um, the, the ways in which it has been used to say this is what is exactly, I, I don't always agree with. Um, and I, um, at the same time, don't avoid those texts. Um, I have preached from those very texts and preached from those very texts from a very contextual lens of uh, this is what the world looked like at this historical time. These were the things that these people were dealing with and experiencing at this particular time. And these are the things we can learn from what they were going through in our time. So Pastor Sledge, I wanna ask you, um, do you have a differing of opinion than what you just heard as it relates to the Bible being the, um, the actual word of God? Well, I, I now I believe, like I said, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. That was it. That I believe the word of God or the Bible was inspired, written by men, inspired by God. Oh, uh, in saying that, and and I believe that there are two types of Bible readers. There are conservative. Well, there's three types of Bible readers. There's conservatives, liberals, and those that are in the middle. Uh, with me, I'm in the middle. A conservative, they believe that the Earth is only five thousand years old. A liberal, uh, believe that that the New Testament, I mean, the Old Testament Genesis is more of a metaphor of how we created a, a society or a group of people. Uh, I'm in the middle. I believe that the Bible is factual, but also I believe a lot of metaphors are involved. I believe there are certain laws that were strictly for certain societies and for a certain group of people that doesn't apply to us now. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, some of it is opinion. Matter of fact, I think Paul wrote a couple of times something about what, what he thought. Some of it is opinionated. But I think, uh, and go back to the question you asked him earlier about them uh, affirming 
Um, whether they're preaching about homosexuality or whatever they're saying, that I I never heard I've never heard a uh, pastor that pastors a, a gay affirming church promote homosexuality. Uh, I don't know where that accusation came from that they're teaching people how to be. I've never heard that and I've never seen that. Uh, uh, so I don't. I think that's unfair to 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 say that they are doing that. I've, the ones I've heard, uh, they're preaching. They preaching the gospel. They preaching the, the gospel message. Uh, but I'm a firm, and I think, uh, and maybe me, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. That that's my core ministry, and and it's hard for me to get around the gospels. Don't get me wrong. I believe the Bible. Everything else is important, but. Uh, at this point and in this season, as we read the word of God, we need to be more responsible on how we read the word of God. We need to be more tolerant of everybody's different views, because as a as a married man, 46, that got children and grandkids, got adult children. I'm going to look at certain scriptures a different than somebody who's single. And, and, and we're going to look at them things in different perspectives. But the reality is, is that to me, if you're not. The, the the primary focus of the Bible is teaching us how to treat each other, how to love. That is the at the end of the day, because if you really think about it, the way we treat each other is very important on how our relationship to God, because God said we can't even have a relationship with him until we learn how to get this relationship down here together. So uh, that's the core. That's the core of the Bible is to preach love and for us to be able to function with each other, regardless of sexuality, regardless of race, regardless of, of different nationalities or whatever, the major function is supposed to be about love. And, and our and the question we have to all challenge ourselves, are we preaching that? Are we teaching people how to love them? Are we teaching people how to love themselves? Because that's in the Bible. Are we teaching people? And, and not to cut you off, Pastor Slade, yeah, but sorry. one of the things I tell those um, some of my students, um, when you when you look at the Bible more so because we have a lot of people who are practitioners of Christianity. And for, for me personally, and one of the things that has helped me evolve to even have this conversation is that I begin to look at religion as a whole, be it Christianity, be it um, the Islamic faith, be it Buddhism, be it um, whatever religion. I've learned to view religion more as a philosophy than a practice. Um, and I, I think that will help um, a lot of people um, bridge this gap. Even in this conversation, it will help us bridge this gap between the affirming and the in the non-affirming. Because the practice of Christianity says I can't have fellowship with a homosexual person because I believe that they're going to hell. Whereas the philosophy of Christianity says I need to love everyone and I need to build a relationship with everyone. And so that I think that's one of the key factors as it relates to um, the embracing of people who are different. Um, and, and you would be surprised. And this is the lead up into my last two questions. There are people who um, who believe that a straight man talking to a gay man would turn the straight man gay. <laughs> like there are people who believe that. Are you serious? There are people who believe that they really believe that. Um, and for years, I operated under the fear of, oh, I can't be seen talking to this gay man because people are going to think I'm gay. And eventually I got to a place where I was, you know, I, I'm not going to say what I said, you know, with the preachers on the line. But, you know, I had a few choice words for myself to sort of push me into a reality of just doing what I'm going to do and do it how I'm going to do it, you know, because I am a straight man. Um, and I can talk to Pastor Simon. I can talk to Bishop McQueen. I can talk to Pastor Penniman. I can talk to Pastor Sled. And I promise you, when I leave out the room, I'm still going to be a straight man. So there are people who really push the narrative. You know, they don't want their, their young boys talking to a gay man, even if the gay man has something to offer them, um, you know, as far as educationally or for as mentorship. You know, I, I've seen it with my own eyes. So my next question, and whoever wants to jump out there and answer this, when we talk about when we hear 
preachers talk about the deliverance of homosexuality. And I know that this is probably going to go full circle with the um, scriptures that we just talked about or with the biblical perspective we just talked about. But when we hear preachers who are, you know, who are bringing people to the altar um, because they're struggling with homosexuality, they are spitting on them. They are, you know, putting prayer blankets on them. They are um, casting out devils of, of the spirit of homosexuality. And um, I know that your perspectives are obvious, um, but just for the stated conversation, I first want to hear from Pastor Sledge about his perspective as it relates to the deliverance from the, um, what some would call the sin of homosexuality. What is your view on that? Okay, my, my view is just like everything, or, or, or whatever you want to call it. One of the problems is, is that our job is not to create conversion opportunities. Our job is to build relationships. And that's where we get, when we do that, we are no different. Let's be honest. In the black church, when we do that, we're no different than the colonizers and the Europeans that try to convert Native Americans by force to become Christians. We're no different than them. We're just as bad. The reality is, is that, like I said, there's, there's a root. Every, everybody's stance and everybody's situation, you can't treat everybody the same way, just like I can't treat an adulterer the same way as everybody else. We, we have gotten, we are not the sin police. We're not the homosexuality police. Uh, that is not, I don't see nowhere in scripture where that is our role as pastors. Uh, when you guide your sheep, you guide sheep to water, you guide them to food, you protect your sheep, you defend your sheep to the death and and uh in some cases but the and that's what our job is we have we have operated outside of our job which means we're operates operating outside the will of god uh i'm a little upset by it because um now by what you say now here's the thing i'm a pastor i didn't grow up in church so my perspective and the way i look at things uh i always look at things at the eye of a sinner and why people don't go to church, why people run away. And that type of behavior is unacceptable uh, because it's, because how can you even ask somebody to help somebody get delivered when you don't have a relationship with them? How can you ask God for deliverance of a person that feel or maybe don't need any deliverance? The reality is, is that we need deliverance from our uh, small mindedness. We need deliverance from our uh, uh, hypocrite hypocrisy from the pulpit, we need deliverance from my nasty tone and tact that we use. Pastor Sledge, I want to pause because I, yeah, I'm, I'm about. I, I want to be um, a little messy. Okay. So you all just bear with me. Do you feel like Pastor Simon, Bishop McQueen, and Pastor Peniman needs deliverance from the no, spirit? Of okay. No, no. I because here's my thing. Even even if I felt that way. How can I honestly say that when I don't even know them? I don't even know them like that. So for me to say whether somebody needs deliverance or not, for somebody I don't know in, in that aspect, then who who am I to uh, say that? That's between, at the end of the day, uh, they need love just like everybody else. They need tolerance. like I can tell you that. They need love from me. They need respect from me. Uh, they need uh, understanding from me. So when they're broken, I need to be there for them. If they ever broke, I don't have to, that, that's build a relationship. All that other stuff, man, that's, that's between them and God. So no, my answer, and, and a lot of, and I might, you know, a lot of black pastors may get upset with me. No, I don't feel, uh, in my heart, and my spirit, I don't feel they need deliverance. They are who they are and who God created them to be. And that's it. So that's it. So Pastor Simon, what is your view on the deliverance theology from the street of homosexuality? Um, I think it's another level of abuse. Um, I think it is another level of oppression that um, some church leaders have decided that this is the way in which they're going to rule with an iron fist. Um, I have been in conversation and relationship with individuals who have gone through these conversion experiences and, and seen the ways in which it has damaged them emotionally, psychologically and spiritually. Um, I've always wondered and, and have had a few conversations and I am, I'm especially interested in hearing what Bishop McQueen has to say, being that he studied psychology um, because 
um, I've always been um, in a lot of ways concerned um, with one, the belief that someone can be delivered from who they are. Um, and then two, the way in which um, that creates a further level of psychological damage, um, but also the psychology of the individuals who believe that someone can be changed from who they are. Um, because I recognize that for them, um, spirituality um, is what they are operating in um, more so from my perspective than theology. Um, and this belief that homosexuality is this spirit um, that can come and take over someone. And I recognize that we, we see it in the text a lot. And so some people have decided that based off of these texts that they've read about Jesus um, delivering someone from a spirit that was um, suffocating them, that then homosexuality has to be one of those spirits. Um, and there's nothing that I have ever seen that has proven that um, to be the case. Um, and I, I, at, at the same time, I, 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 with that adding that um, I am very, I am one who holds very true to the reality and the fact that who you are is innate in who you are. Um, it is a part of you. It is a part of your spirit, your DNA, your makeup. Um, and no one can deliver you from that. Okay. Um, Bishop? Yes. Um, uh, obviously, I don't believe that deliverance from homosexuality is possible, let alone um, uh, that it is a productive practice. Um, it has strong mental health effects on people. Um, as someone who went through conversion therapy, I did. I'm fourth generation apostolic Pentecostal. I went through conversion therapy. I had them lay hands on me and try to cast homosexuality out of my belly, out my nose, out my hairline, out my my hair follicles. I mean, all of the above. Everything you can think of, they tried to cast the, the whatever the homosexuality out, and 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 I guess it didn't come. But um, it it has a long term effect of depression. Um, I think, and that's actually this opens up the door to very important conversation. Sometimes we associate the uh, common dysfunctions within a certain demographic <laughs> with the demographic instead of realizing the treatment of that demographic within society is the reason why certain dysfunctions may, there may be a preponderance of certain dysfunctions. For example, you know, I, I um, when my uh, husband and I were uh, purchasing a commercial property on uh, the South side of Chicago, a white man, a Caucasian per white man um, said to me, and I don't even think he realized he said it, poor thing. He said to me, um, yeah, you know, um, uh, what do you think about the riots going on downtown? You know, black people are just crazy. It's in their blood. It's, I think it's the melanin. You know, it's, it just is what it is. You know, black people have hyper, hyper aggressiveness. Um, um, you know, and he proceeded to talk about, you know, some of the neighborhoods on the south side. I mean, look at all of the, the black people on the south side and the way they treat their homes and their neighborhoods. No conversation about gentrification and how many African-American people have lacked certain resources, OK, that have uh, not come from the government and two predominantly black neighborhoods. And of course, there are higher rates of crime because black neighborhoods are over police and there are all kinds of certain dynamics from society that contributes to something that has now been associated with a demographic. Likewise, with homosexuals, because of the way they've been treated in the deliverance theology around homosexuality, there is higher depression, suicide rate. I was a youth pastor in the Apostolic Church. We had three youth to attempt suicide. One succeeded all around being same gender loving individual. One guy, uh, his mother, Sunday school leader, found him in his bedroom hanging from the ceiling fan and um, had hung himself. He was 16 years old all around um, because he couldn't get delivered from homosexuality. OK, um, and so um, it has great toxicity. It is bad for. Uh, like many practices in the black church that we won't get into, it's just bad for our mental health. And um, and so I don't believe, I do believe in deliverance, but I, I don't believe you can be delivered from homosexuality. Okay. And, and I, I want to ask this question for Pastor Penderman. You know, we're in a very crucial time. And I, this is, I have one more question after this one, I promise you will be done. 
we're in a very crucial time in our society. Um, you know, with the police brutality, with um, political leaders who are not um, in touch with the struggles and the um, plight of black people. And there are some who are equating the fight for black equality with the fight for um, LGBT um, equality. Um, is that something that you feel um, hinders the fight for the LGBT community, or do you feel like fusing those together um, is more productive for the LGBT community? And then I want to ask Pastor Sledge a similar question: um, Do he does he feel like it should be put on the same level with LGBT and Black Lives that are being um, that the fight for Black Lives? So I want to ask Pastor Penham, and then I want to hear from Pastor Sledge. 60 seconds. <laughs> 60 <laughs> seconds. Um, I think it depends on the audience, really. I, I, I think that um, we, as, as Black folks, have to close the door and have an internal conversation about the humanity of uh, all of us. Um, I think that I, I walk in the room, I walk in with my black female lesbian self, and I don't want to be oppressed for any of those things. Um, and um, I'm not always able to separate why I'm being oppressed. Um, um, and so I think we have to have a conversation about humanity and oppression um, among ourselves. Um, and I think in in the larger in the larger society with white folks and other folks i think it's a helpful conversation to make a, a comparison um because um people tend to understand civil rights and human rights in a different way um but so i so i think i have i have i have one conversation with family and another conversation with the broader community but i think it's the, it's still a conversation about, um, you know, love, you know, what does love require you to do? Um, and so I am, um, yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a, I've been black all my life. <laughs> I have been black all my life and I have felt the effects of that in ways um, that are continue to be important to me. Um, and so I fight for, for Black Lives Matter, um, even while there are members of the Black Lives Matters movement that would not fight for me, um, so. Wow. Pastor Sledge? Uh, I'm gonna say. Oh wow! Okay, I, I don't know what happened. So, um, I, my final question is for Pastor Penderman. Malcolm X said this um, back in the '60s, and it still rings true today. He said the African American woman is probably the most hated individual on the face of the earth. And the intersectionality that you're dealing with, being a black woman, um, being a woman, and being a lesbian black woman, as you just stated, mm -hmm. uh, gives you um, several battles that you have to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to fight sexism. You have to fight um, people who are um, people who are not supportive of your lifestyle. Then you have to deal with the issue of being black. Then you have to deal with the issue of not being black enough. So that, <laughs> that you that you have to deal with. Um, how do you um, how do you handle or deal with um, all of those intersections of your life as a as a woman? Um, I you know I get tired, um, and so I handle them you know with therapy. <laughs> Um, with surrounding myself with um, people who love me and who make it clear that they love me. Um, you commented earlier about my comfort level with 
um, being on the, on the platform with all the brothers. Um, I grew up with seven brothers. I only have one biological sister. Um, and my only son was murdered in 2018. Um, I have 25 nephews um, and maybe about seven nieces. And so I'm very, very comfortable with my brothers. And um, and I, I, I use some of them who, who I know love me to, um, to remind me when I'm in a sexist environment um, that is just um, that is just dripping with that um, that that I am loved and that not everybody else feels that way. And the same thing for my other identities. Um, I fight sexism in the church still, and um, let me tell you that same gender loving communities um, have not been delivered from sexism. Um, <laughs> And um, and so um, I fight um, all of those battles on a daily basis with little microaggressions that come at you. I'm also a full-time hospice chaplain. And in the world of chaplaincy, we just had a conversation today about how you walk into a room as a female chaplain and, um, and, there, and then might be pushback. Um, there is often pushback. I'm often called a girl preacher. Um, I'm 55, almost 56 years old. I'm, I haven't been a girl in a really long time, but people feel free to call me a girl. Um, and, um, and so all of those things happen on a daily basis. And I do, and I deal with it by surrounding myself with people that love me. That's all I got. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you guys so much for taking the time out to I, I didn't hear you, Pastor Sledge. I don't know if he was saying something. He was. Oh. He is. Okay, I, I'm having some technical difficulties. Y'all can oh, hear okay. me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so, so the answer to my question is, I believe that uh, one of the concerns is I don't believe that you can put them together because one of the things uh, is, is that you can question whether somebody is gay or not, you really can't tell, but you'll always be able to tell that I'm black. And I believe uh, because I'm black, I will, black people are more discriminated than any other group of people. Uh, now, if you're gay and black, then you got some other issues and concerns. So now I don't think you, you can, I think they're two separate uh, issues, but they're both important that we need to march and speak up for them individually. I agree. I agree with that, uh, Pastor Sledge. And um, we're going to end on that note. I want to say thank you guys so much for uh, participating in this conversation. Thank you guys so much for bringing your insight. Thank you guys so much for disagreeing with dignity. I mean, I hope that this can be the start of something, um, even if it's on a minuscule level, uh, bridging this gap between the non-affirming and the affirming churches within our country. Um, because I really think that that is something that a broader discussion needs to take place, um, you know, about certain issues um, that, that people really don't want to discuss um, that goes on in the non-affirming, in the affirming churches. So I wanted to thank you guys so much for um, being a part of this conversation. I, I will be in touch with you guys. I will be reaching out to you again for part two of this um, conversation. So appreciate you guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Yes, sir.